President Biden has abdicated his position as the president of the United States in terms of his authority among our allies overseas. Now, that sounds like a pretty strong accusation, but the evidence is starting to become embarrassing and overwhelming. And this is not a good thing for the United States. It's not a good thing for the president. And he still has the power and the ability to change course and to get this corrected before any significant more harm is done to our prestige and our ability to operate overseas. Listen, the, the, the issue specifically in the Israel-Hamas war and, and expressly with Benjamin Netanyahu, another country. And this is particularly uh, uh, prevalent when it comes to Benjamin Netanyahu, who right now is flat out running the show. Don't care what anybody wants to be the truth or, or claims to otherwise. The facts are unequivocal and just how bad this is. I've never seen anything like this in my lifetime. And we're going to show you right now. Now, on the State of the Union last Thursday, many of the Democrats breathed a great sigh of relief because they were, you know, lots of concerns heading into that. Does President Biden have the stamina to speak for a whole hour and not have any of these, you know, issues that may appear to be the onset of dementia? They breathed a sigh of relief because he was full of vigor, full of energy. And that was nowhere more uh, evident than in this uh, following clip here, where he talked very specifically up to address some of the Democratic concerns, especially that voters had showed on Super Tuesday that they were concerned about the Palestinian people in Israel and how he talked about how he was worried about them and what he was going to do as a result. This war. has taken a greater toll on innocent civilians than all previous wars in Gaza combined. More than 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, most of whom are not Hamas. Thousands and thousands of innocents, women and children, girls and boys, also orphaned. Nearly two million more Palestinians under bombardment or displacement. Homes destroyed, neighbors in rubble, cities in ruin. Families out food, water, medicine. It's heartbreaking. I've been working nonstop to establish an immediate ceasefire that would last for six weeks to get all the prisoners released, all the hostages released, to get the hostages home and ease the intolerable and humanitarian crisis and build toward an enduring, a more something more enduring. The United States has been leading international efforts to get more humanitarian assistance to Gaza. Tonight, I'm directing the U.S. military to lead an emergency mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza that can receive large shipments carrying food, water, medicine, and temporary shelters. No U.S. boots will be on the ground. A temporary pier will enable a massive increase in the amount of humanitarian assistance getting into Gaza every day. I am directing the United States military, he said. Remember that phrase. That's going to come back here in just a second. But the first part of that video made it sound like, man, he is being very firm. He sounds absolutely in control, uh, directive uh, or authoritative, very confident in what he's saying. And, you know, these these terrible troll on the Palestinian people is not going to stand we're going to do something about it. And here's what I'm going to do. I have directed the U.S. military to create this pier in the water, and uh, we're going to bring some food to the Palestinian people. So that's what he said. And then after the the uh, the speech was over, uh, he was caught in a hot mic moment uh, talking to a couple of Democratic colleagues on the floor. I was telling the secretary, you know, I was in Jordan and uh, Israel this weekend. And just, you know, we got to keep pushing what you're doing on the humanitarian stuff and all this stuff. So, I told him, baby, I'm going to this. I said, baby, you know, I'm going to come to Sure, just... I'm going to have my head good. That was good. So, got caught there. He's like, but, but he was caught saying, I'm telling BB, we're going to have to have a come to Jesus meeting. And okay, if any of you are from the South and aren't really familiar with that, that phrase, that means I'm going to lay the law down to him and I'm going to tell him, this is the deal. This is what's going on. This is how it's going to work. Uh, and here's what you're going to do. That again, sounds very authoritative and people are going, wow, that's, that's really amazing. Uh, I guess he really is finally changing and he's finally doing some stuff here. And subsequent to that, uh, he reported that 
uh, Biden did that if it, Netanyahu goes into Rafa and attacks into Rafa without there being uh, humanitarian corridors and, and, a, and a plan in place that the United States agrees with, that's going to be a red line. That is a red line that Netanyahu was going to cross. So again, it sounds like, wow, he's really starting to make some changes. Well, over the weekend, he was asked by MSNBC to explain that. What exactly does this red line mean? The defense of Israel is still critical, so there's no red line. I'm going to cut off all weapons so they don't have the Iron Dome to protect them. They don't have. But there's red lines that if it crosses and they can, you cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead as a consequence of going after. There's other ways to deal, to get to, to deal with the with with the trauma caused by Hamas. So, OK, so there really is no red line. I've already said, he point blank said, there's no red line that I'm going to actually stop providing all the weapons, ammunition, and military support that Netanyahu demands. I'm going to keep doing it. There is no red line for that. And then he tried to, well, not really walk it back, but tried to caveat it by saying, but there is a red line. But I mean, you can't have 30, there is no red line. If you're not willing to take any action, then there is no red line. No one can claim otherwise. And if anyone, was confused about what the, what by Netanyahu thinks about that, with whether he got that message. Here's what he said this morning. Some of my friends that are going out there to battle uh, Hamas is that they don't have the support truly of the United States right now, and that you guys are being pressured to come off the gas a little bit. Is that true? Look, uh, we have our agreements uh, uh, on the basic goals, but we also have disagreements on how to achieve them. Ultimately, it's Israel that has to decide. Our neck is on the line. Are they encouraging you to get off the Our gas, though, Prime Minister? And beheaded. Well, I'm telling you that we're not getting off the gas. I'm telling you that we have to take care of Israel's security in our future, and that requires eliminating the terrorist army. That's a prerequisite for victory. That victory is important not only for us, it's important for the civilized world as we're fighting these barbarians. So he very emphatically said, we're not letting our foot off the gas. We're making the calls and nobody else. Now, at the outset of this, I told you to remember that comment that President Biden made, President Biden made during the State of the Union when he announced this floating pier that's going to be coming into there, implying that it was his decision that he ordered the U.S. military to move on that. But now then we have earlier today in the Jerusalem Post, this uh, news now then we realize this was actually Netanyahu's idea. And when we get into the, 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 the details of the story, it turns out that this is something they've been trying to get for months. So Netanyahu wanted America to do this. And let me, let me relay out to you what that means, the consequences of this, the realities of this. The leader of another country, Israel, is telling the American president what he's going to do with our military, that he is going to ask the president of the United States to spend two months preparing for an operation because that's how about how long it's going to take before any food is finally ready because all of the logistic issues and supplies and the equipment has to be brought together and assembled. <clears throat> then it has to, you know, traverse across the oceans to actually get there. Then it's got to be set up and started to operate. Then the food has to be coming, all that. It'll take at least two months for all that to happen. Instead of Biden looking Netanyahu in the face and saying, open the damn gate. There's a bunch of gates in there. You don't have enough? Make new ones. Open the open the fence up. Call open some holes in. There are hundreds of food trucks just waiting on the sides of roads. They could go in this afternoon. This could happen today. We don't need to wait two months to alleviate the suffering for the uh, Palestinian people. They could be done now if President Biden was the commander in chief of the U.S. military and was being a firm, strong international leader. You always want to talk about how America could provide leadership. Folks, this is the where the metal meets the road. This is hardcore. If you're going to have tough love with your allies and if you want to your your foes to actually fear you, this is where it matters. When when our adversaries and opponents and, and those who might be see that our own allies is calling the shots here, and instead of demanding that our allies who we're providing bombs for and we're providing all the ammunition and everything that they need to sustain war, that we're not even going to ask them to do their own job. We're going to do it for them. 
And then all this boisterous claims about how coming to Jesus and red lines by our president mean absolutely nothing. And we're being humiliated on the national stage. But I, I assure you, Netanyahu views our president with contempt right now because he knows he doesn't mean any of the hard rhetoric that he says. And he knows he's going to end up doing everything that he asked for. <clears throat> well, uh, that's that's the, the current issues here. It gets worse. OK, so you may recall we've shown it a few times here back in November. Actually, this is going all the way back to October. Is that President Biden keeps saying that whatever's going to happen here got to be a two state solution. In January, one of the reporters specifically asked him, is there a chance for a two state solution? And he said this. Are we consider conditions on Israel aid, given what Netanyahu said about a one state? I think we'll be able to work something. What does that mean? There are a number of types of two-state solutions. There's a number of countries that are members of the UN that are still don't have their own military. A number of states that will have limitations on them. And so I think there's ways in which this could work. But Bibi has said he's opposed to any of two no, two-state no, solutions. So what is he open to? Did you talk about it this morning? So the reporter told him, but Netanyahu said he's against a two-state solution. How's that going to work? He's like, no, no, no. That's not what he said. Remember that? So that was in January. In February, Secretary of State Blinken uh, was on a, a, at the time, very famous uh, trip, diplomatic tour across the Middle East, where he went to Saudi Arabia to try to get their help in helping the Palestinians and to try to find a, a solution to the end of this war. And he talked about at the end, one of the key components. But with regard specifically to normalization, the Crown Prince reiterated Saudi Arabia's strong interest in pursuing that. But he also made clear what uh, he had said uh, to me before, uh, which is that in order to do that, two things are required, an end to the conflict in Gaza and a clear, credible, time-bound path to the establishment of a Palestinian state. So everywhere you look, we are on record with our allies, with the American people. A two-state solution is a non-negotiable part of what's going on here. Because at least rhetorically, that is in line with what I've been saying from the outset. If you don't have peace for the Palestinian people and the people of Israel, then there will be no peace for the Palestinian people or the Israeli people. That should be record. That should not a hard. That's not rocket science. If you subjugate one people and crush them and give them no path to peace or hope for the future, they are not going to just sit there passively by. They're going to continue to be a threat to the Israeli people. So you go down one path, you're going to guarantee that you're not going to have any peace. I'm going to talk more about that shortly. But that should be self-evident. Again, not hard to figure out. So it makes sense that the U.S. would be for that. And in case there was any doubt about where the president was at the State of the Union, he was, again, very emphatic on a two-state solution. As we look to the future, the only real solution to the situation is a two-state solution over time. <laughs> And I say this, as a lifelong supporter of Israel, my entire career, no one has a stronger record with Israel than I do. I challenge any of you here. I'm the only American president to visit Israel in wartime. But there is no other path that guarantees Israel's security and democracy. Man, I really wish he hadn't added all that extra stuff after he said the two-state solution. I'm the, there's no better friend of Israel than I am. And I'm the only American president that's, you know, all that stuff. Because then that makes this next part even more embarrassing. This is yesterday what Netanyahu said after Biden made that statement. Make sure you're aware of the timing here. Here's his comment. They support the action that we're taking to destroy the remaining terrorist battalions of Hamas. They say that once we destroy the Hamas, the last thing we should do is put in Gaza, in charge of Gaza, the Palestinian Authority that... Uh, educates its children towards terrorism and pays for terrorism. And they also support my position that says that we should resoundingly reject the attempt to ram down our throats a Palestinian state because uh, the majority of Israelis understand that if we don't do this, what we'll have is a repetition of the 
October 7th massacre, which is bad for Israel, bad for the Palestinians, bad for the future of peace in the Middle East. Resoundingly reject anyone force jamming down our throats a two-state solution for Palestine. Folks, there is no more direct repudiation publicly than what Netanyahu just did to the American public, an uh, American president, who just told the whole world how strong he was and how he's the best friend of Israel and how the our best friend there is stomping in his face. That I, I you can't see it any other way than that. But if you need more convincing, then on American television this morning, Netanyahu dug the hole a little deeper. We're not fighting just our battle. We're fighting the battle of civilization against barbarism. We're fighting the battle against the Iran terror axis, which goes against America. They say that you are the great Satan and we're the small Satan standing in their way. Uh, these are the people who are your worst enemies, our common worst enemies. And at this point, the entire international community, at least the civilized community, should stand behind Israel. So he's saying, despite what the president said there, we should stand behind Israel. And then there's one last piece, he said here, one last dig to the president, directly digging to the president, basically saying, just shut up and do what I say. Victory is close. I mean, we've destroyed, as, as I said, three quarters of those fighting battalions. We're very close to victory. The best thing we can do for the future of the, the Middle East, for the future of peace, for the future of those hostages is get a speedy victory. And the victory will come as soon as, uh, I think will come sooner, the more united we are, not the, uh, not divided, or at least not given the, the appearance of division. Not giving the appearance of division. So quit saying stuff that's opposite of what I'm saying, because I want a speedy victory. I want you to give me all your stuff, all your bombs and your bullets. I don't want to hear any more complaints. I want you to do my work, my job of feeding the Palestinian people. Don't care how expensive it is. Don't care how much you got to bring your naval assets in there. I don't want to hear anything except yes, sir. That Does that sound like a strong American president? I, I mean, I'm aghast at this. This is such a big deal. I cannot overstate how important this is and how bad this is for America that the president of the United States on our biggest ally in the Middle East will not say a word to him and will then support and supply all the bombs he needs to continue on with his horrific military operations in there that are killing hundreds of Palestinians by the day. So you had all those Democratic congresswomen in there and they were holding these signs, you know, immediate ceasefire now and take care of the Palestinian people. I saw a lot of them doing this in North, North, North and South when Biden was going through that piece where he was describing how bad it is for the Palestinian people. But then he'll do nothing about it. And he has leverage. He has the ability to do something about it. That's why this is so anguishing to me. Look, I, as I've said from the outset of this and always have said and still say today, the Israeli people deserve peace. They deserve security. They deserve it. But so do the Palestinian people. They're no less deserving of life and a possible future and a hope than the Israeli people are. They both deserve it. And if they don't both get it, neither one of them are going to have it. And listen, let me also reiterate something I've said many times in the past. Netanyahu is just flat out wrong. I mean, he is, he is just blind in his hatred for the Palestinian people, that he has blinded himself to just basic military realities. You are not going to kill your way to peace. You are not going to get rid of the problem by killing Palestinian people. Even if you somehow manage to get these last battalions you claim that are somewhere in Rafah in the southern part of, uh, of Gaza, even if somehow you kill all of them, you have not brought any peace to your country. To the contrary, you have brought far, far, far more insecurity than ever existed prior to October of 2023. And look, uh, a re renewing of the of the bidding here to where let's take a look again. Don't forget this. The whole issue of October 7th could have been avoided by Netanyahu. But as is now common knowledge, and it's anywhere out there if you want to Google it, and I'm talking Western press, not any kind of, you know, something from the Middle East, 
he was largely responsible for the conditions that existed in the Gaza Strip against which they rebelled and, and conducted this horrific terrorist attack. Now, in case there's anybody who wants to leap on that, let me confirm and clarify that the Hamas people and the, those Palestinians who committed the atrocities are 100% wrong. And even the bad things that Netanyahu did, they are responsible for what they did and what happened to the Israeli people on that day, period, full stop. But Netanyahu was the one who blew it. He conditioned, he continued the and fostered the conditions that led to the desperation and the hatred of the Palestinian people against the, their Jewish captors. He created that. He kept Hamas afloat. He kept the Palestinian Authority weak. He kept them divided, but kept them both in power because as long as there was a Hamas power, power in there, then the Western world could say, yes, of course, you're not going to have a peace or a two-state solution with them because the, it genuinely is in the Hamas declaration that they want the eradication of the of Israeli state and that they don't recognize their right to exist. That's a true statement. By, uh, Netanyahu knows that. And so as long as they are a weakened state, but they're holding that political objective, then he knows no one's going to force him to make a two-state solution. He miscalculated, though, because he didn't realize how high the level of anger and hatred towards the Israelis were and against his policies that now then they blew it open. And of course, he failed on a security level, too, because his government didn't see it coming. So every way you want to look, he has significant responsibilities for the creation of this mess. And now he is digging a hole much deeper for the entire region and his own people now. President Biden should recognize that the best thing he can do for, for the people of Israel is to give them a shot at peace. And it's going to be a long time before that comes down, even stability. It, Netanyahu has now made it so hard that there is no good solution in the near term. You can stop the harm, though, and at least start the clock towards a better future, because it's possible. If President Biden says you will not continue this murderous uh, operation here that kills wanton hundreds of innocent people by the day anymore with our bombs, you, you do one more day of that. And it's the last plane load of American supplies that's helped. There should be an absolute red line with which we will no longer provide anything. That's the only leverage we have, and it is powerful leverage. That's what we should do. We should no longer block everything that happens at the United Nations. If there's something that's grounded in truth and in fact, and it's real, then it flies, it stands. If we want to be the world's leaders, if we want to have the moral authority to hold the Russians accountable when they do something or the China's accountable when they violate human rights, then we have to hold our friends accountable and we have to be accountable to our own standards as well. And when we violate that and when we allow our, our leader to be humiliated on the public stage like this while our friend continues to violate everything we claim to stand for, we have no moral authority to say anything to anyone. And there is much more chaos in, in, in the world. And our, our ability to influence events goes through the floor, even with our great military power. No one's going to listen to us anymore. We're not viewed as that shining light on a hill as we should be viewed, as we have been in the past as we could again be in the future, if the course gets changed. That is so important. There is so much riding on this, folks. It's not a small issue. This is not just a some kind of partisan attack on the president. I'm not just complaining about things. I'm telling you, there is a real big measurable problem with potential long-term consequences for our national security, for our standing in the world. This has got to get fixed. And I hope that a lot of these other Democratic members of Congress don't just hold up a few placards here or be satisfied because President Biden went and gave a, uh, an emotional speech where he had a lot of energy. That's the lowest level of thing you even need to worry about. His policies are far more important than what's going on here. And I can't, I, it bears repeating the, the public way that Netanyahu is shaming our president and telling him, I don't care what you say, we will do whatever he says. No one's going to ram it down our throats, to quote Benjamin Netanyahu, in direct response to what President Biden said at the State of the Union. That can't be okay with the White House. It can't be okay. It's not okay with me, and I doubt it's okay with you. And folks, listen, I'm really asking you to share this video far and wide. 
Send this to everybody you know and make sure they're aware of this because too many people, even supporters of the president, were clapping and thinking, yay, that was a great speech. No, it was terrible. And the ramifications of that speech since are just terrible. And I assure you, all of our adversaries are paying a great deal of attention to this. The issue is not about Hamas anymore. They, so many of them have been killed, but the damage that's been done is is far greater than anything that Hamas did at the time of, of the October 7th event. It's now much worse than that because of how many thousands upon thousands of women, children, and innocent men that have been killed in the, in the, uh, the alleged going after the Hamas uh, terrorists who were genuine targets. It should have been done right. It could have been done right. They could have maintained all the support of the West, all the support of the United States, if they had done this the right military way to where the military means had a possibility of accomplishing a, a political outcome. He, Netanyahu destroyed that chance. He's killing all these innocent Palestinian people, and he's destroying any chance that his country has for peace. The best thing Biden can do for the people of Israel is to tell Netanyahu, you either do this or you're on your own and mean it and stop the plane loads. That's the only thing that will get his attention because that will get the attention of the people in Israel. And by the way, although you don't hardly ever see it on Western military, there's a large uh, protest movement going on within Israel right now to where they're demanding that Netanyahu resign. That will gain steam if they see that now they're losing the only support they have in the Western world or primarily the only support, the biggest supporter. That's what they they need to change courses there because that's the the Israel people still have to make their own decisions. And I know there's lots in Israel who agree with everything that Netanyahu said. That's a true statement. But that's a call. That's a call they've got to make. Our call is to care about our national security and our reputation and credibility extending well beyond this war here. And that is that we are an independent nation who is not told what to do by the leader of another country to the to our detriment. Because that is what's happening right now. That's your that's your deep dive for today, folks. Obviously, I feel pretty strongly about this, and I hope that now that you have the facts and the and the truth, that uh, that you'll do whatever you can, whether it's writing letters, encouraging your Democratic, if you happen to be a Democrat, any of your members of Congress, or if you're just an independent person, send letters to your to the to these Democratic leaders and ask them to start doing something to change the course before it's too late, before we suffer harm that may not be reparable anymore, or at least not in a long time. Let's avoid that worst outcome. Thanks for your time today. I really appreciate you guys. Uh, and we'll see you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.